Uh, welcome everybody. It is the is the top of the hour and uh, we're very glad to have Eric um, here. Uh, he is uh, my counterpart with the Housing Commission and um, we we you know that we have had many conversations about high speed internet um, to and the digital divide and particularly Eric you and I talked about this particularly since the pandemic it's really um, exposed how much um, high speed internet access is critical right so um, and when I had initial conversations with Eric he really was very patient with me and educated me on some of the some of the dimensions in terms of the requirements for um, for housing so we you know you know that we um, we looked at one gig up one gig down and and Eric I think you'll you'll be able to give us perspective about what some of the the challenges are from a housing housing perspective. So uh, we turn the floor over to you. Delighted, delighted that you could be with us. Sure, I really appreciate the invite. Um, so I feel like I've been on a lot of these lately. <laughs> it's nice to start, it's nice to have a little bit of a more of a compact crew. Um, so yeah, my name is Eric Berkey. I've been chair of the Housing Commission since I guess January of 2020. So I got a couple meetings in <laughs> before this all started. Um, I've been on that commission since 2016 or so. Um, and so I, I've always, uh, I, I say always, but for, last, for like the last six, seven years, I've been very interested in, in housing policy as it relates to equity and, and civil rights and just kind of, you know, economic issues generally. Um, so anyway, I figured tonight, since you all have been talking about, um, you know, internet access and housing, um, you know, the Housing Commission, uh, we do look at housing gener uh, housing issues generally, but I would say that, you know, probably about 80 to 90% of our time is focused on housing affordability um, or, you know, affordable housing, which is a term of art, which I can briefly describe. Um, so we do look at like other, you know, market rate housing issues, but, um, we predominantly look at the affordable housing that that Arlington supports and helps create. Um, you know, that's a, a fairly highly regulated program. And so I can give a brief overview of how it's funded um, and kind of the requirements that um, our, our developer our partner providers kind of face and some of the policy choices there. And again, I'm I'm not a, a policy person or housing person by trade, so this is very much a layperson's explanation right. uh, of, of a lay of the land here. So let me, I'm gonna share my my PowerPoint here. I promise it will be fairly brief um, and I'll make that in, in present mode. So I think you all can see that. Um, perfect, okay, so, uh, and I, I, I have to confess, Kathleen McSweeney, who used to be on the commission who some folks may be uh, familiar with. She's been involved with the county for a long time. I stole part of this presentation from her, um, so credit to her. Um, so a couple things. So the county's affordable housing program, um, one of the acronyms that you may have heard um, is uh, AHIF, which is the Affordable Housing Investment Fund. Um, I'm going to give a really brief overview of AHIF and the funding. Um, it's really, it might not seem like it's, um, totally tangentially connected to what you're all interested in, but um, it's incredibly relevant. I would say um, vast majority of our discussions about policy are really about financing. Um, and that's what you learn really quickly is, is it's all about how you pay for it and how you can structure deals and make it work. And so it's just very critical to understand how these um, uh, developments, especially the, the large apartment building developments get funded um, because you know that really dictates the policy choices we can make as a community, and then also the programs that they can you know choose to provide or not. So anyway, AHIF, uh, the Affordable Housing Investment Fund, um, it's uh, it's a pretty great vehicle. Not um, most most jurisdictions in Virginia don't have something like this. Um, we do. It's been around for I want to say at least 15, 17 years or so. Um, it's a low interest revolving loan fund. Um, so basically, um, and I'll get to this in the next slide, but basically what it is, is it's a pot of money. It could be anywhere from as low as, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 million and as, as high as 25, 30, uh, depending upon several factors, million dollars each year that the county can decide to, you know, loan out to developers. Um, and it's typically uh, affordable housing developers 
um, to help facilitate the development and construction you know, of affordable um, buildings here in Arlington. And I, I'm giving you a very uh, general overview. So if you have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, the basic condition for using those loan funds is that in return, along with some other conditions, the main one is that um, the committed affordable units that are created as a result will be um, uh, affordable under the uh, county scheme for um, between 30 and many times 60 years. And so the county really locks in a certain rate of affordability for those units. Um, so that's really important, um, especially as the county's stock of market rate uh, affordable housing. And again, that's a term of art I can, again, briefly discuss, but but that has been uh, just, just rapidly decreasing over like the last 10 years or so. And so the county is looking at many strategies um, to try to stem that tide, but one is to, um, you know, fund programs like AHIF to at least get more uh, committed affordable units um, uh, developed in the county. Um, so AHIF is funded by several sources. Um, so the county, you know, they get some tax uh, revenue that goes into there. Um, but the, the main sources of income, aside from annual appropriations, are going to be a couple big buckets. Um, one is uh, contributions that developers... So I'm getting some feedback there. Is that me? Is that somebody? Oops. Somebody needs to mute themselves. Is that better? Okay, cool. All right, no feedback. Awesome. So um, there's a couple big buckets. Um, so whenever a developer comes into Arlington, you've probably seen this if you ever read Arrow Now or, or Sun Gazette or, or what have you, uh, they'll come in, they want to do a big building. Uh, and so the county has a legal scheme where um, typically in those projects, um, typically they're not by right. Typically the county, uh, the developer has to do a site plan. They've got to do like a lot of planning with the county. And so as a part of that process, typically the developer will have a choice between either um, creating a certain amount of committed affordable units on site um, or putting them elsewhere in the county or contributing a certain amount that's dictated by this scheme to the county's affordable housing investment fund. I'd say almost always the developers are making the cash contribution to that fund. Um, so you can see projects where the county will get two, three, even maybe four million dollars into that investment fund you know, from one um, project. Um, also payoffs, it is a loan fund. So ultimately developers are required to pay the loans back to the county. Um, one of the challenges with the way these projects are funded is that um, you know, aside from the county's annual kind of allocations to the fund, um, we never know quite how much we're going to have as far as developer repayments um, or contributions. So that, you know, that's always been one of the challenges of this fund as far as supporting projects and knowing how much money we're going to have in a given year. There's a limited amount of federal funding that goes into there, maybe like less than $2 million a year. Um, and, and some of that funding can be used not just for construction, but also for wraparound services and other things. But um, for our purposes, really, it's it's mostly the county who's funding this AHIF. Um, and so, like I said, it, it really goes towards new construction or preserving, uh, you know, current affordable housing. Or sometimes what developers will do is they'll buy a building that's not currently affordable under the scheme and then those units will then become committed affordable units and they might use the money to buy it, do some rehab, that that type of thing. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. So the reason I'm kind of giving this brief, real brief presentation, we're going to get into Internet uh, service providers and all that, is because um, when developers put these deals together, there's typically about you know three different sources or so, and that's very much simplifying it. But I'd say three big sources um, of money uh, that they're going to put into the deal. So the first is there is going to be a primary lender, and that could be like Bank of America. Um, that could be, you know, just a community bank. Sometimes um, churches or other, um, you know, like-minded institutions that want to get into housing. They might have money, and they're, you know, so they'll, you know, loan out money. Um, so there's usually a primary lender. Um, then um, they'll have a secondary loan, and that might be. Um, they might get financing. Well, I, I would say most times, actually, they're getting financing through the um, it's the federal low income housing tax credit um, program that's administered by the states. So in Virginia, that's administered by an entity called Virginia Housing. 
which used to be called VHDA. And so where I'm getting to is, um, you know, they got a primary lender, but then they're usually going to have to get tax credit um, equity financing. And what that really is, if you don't know, is basically um, in exchange for fat favorable tax treatment, um, you know, uh, uh, certain institutions, if it's equity funds or whomever, big companies, they can basically contribute like into um, this pool of money and basically help support these affordable housing projects. In exchange, they get very favorable tax treatment. OK, so it's kind of it's supposed to be kind of a win win um, process. It's not unlimited and it is competitive at the state level. And so um, where I'm getting to is the way these projects are financed. I almost think of a, a series of boxes and the boxes, as you start thinking about the different sources of um, funding, it just gets a little smaller each time. And so, you know, the first big box would be, you know, obviously just the suitability of the project and getting financing. But then the smaller one kind of um, inside of that is going to be, uh, you know, adhering to all the things you need to under the different scoring criteria by Virginia Housing. Because these are competitive tax credits, there's a lot of things that projects have to do. Um, in order to be competitive under this program. Um, and doing more usually costs more. Um, and of course, these projects only work if they're financially viable. Um, and so that's a box that they have to fit into. So that's kind of the second pool of money is the tax credit financing. And then the third um, is typically AHIF. So AHIF is not typically the largest source of funding for these projects locally, but it is a significant one. Um, it can either be a gap one or it even can be kind of like as much as maybe like 20 to 30% of the total cost. Um, it can be significant. And with um, AHIF here, um, Arlington also has its own scoring system in order to get loans because we also don't have an unlimited pool of money. And so that's also a competitive process by which developers such as AHC or APA or Wesley Housing, who are kind of the big three in Arlington, can, can propose projects to the county, go through what we call the Notice of Funding Availability process, um, which is competitive, which also has its own scoring criteria to try to get that county funding. So as you're seeing, the boxes are just getting a little smaller each time, right? So making these deals um, work can be, can be quite challenging. Um, and that's notwithstanding um, uh, federal government rules through the Department of Housing and Urban Development and, and kind of other federal and state um, regulations. Um, so there, um, the Virginia housing rules, as well as the the ones to the county's um, NOFA, they do speak to internet, um, uh, free internet uh, and internet being provided. And I can speak to that generally, and then I'll conclude my presentation and we can have a discussion. Um, so for Virginia housing, they do award points um, for both projects building up infrastructure so that they're like broadband ready. Um, but then they also award points for free Wi-Fi. Um, I don't quote me on this, but I think typically most projects that we've seen locally, um, or I would say most, but a lot of them do try to hit this requirement. Um, as you can see, um, from a like a speed speed standpoint, it's not a very high requirement. It's only ten megabytes per second download and three um, upload. I think this has been in there for several years now. Um, and uh, like I said, I, as I understand it, um, many of the providers do try to do this. I'm not sure that it's happening in every project. Um, what is new, though, if I can go to the next slide here. Awesome. Um, what I can go, what I can say um, is new is that in the the local score, scoring criteria for Arlington's uh, AHIF, our Affordable uh, Housing Investment Fund, um, I think either this year or last year, um, it instituted scoring criteria with regards to uh, broadband. Uh, now, broadband in our process here is defined at 30 megabytes per second, which is obviously much higher than the Virginia housing one. Um, I don't know if any projects as of yet have hit this criteria. I've asked around. I did speak to one of my colleagues who works at one of the affordable housing um, uh, developers, and uh, she said that uh, they've had one project so far um, where they've done um, free broadband, and she's not sure if they've hit this criteria. Um, so I think I'll just conclude here. Um, a couple thoughts on all this. Um, uh, free Wi-Fi for our affordable housing residents, I think it's a great idea, especially you know in light of the pandemic and increased needs and especially the digital divide. Um, it looks like it's something that the state certainly has been looking at for a while and the county is starting to look at here um, locally as well. 
Um, I guess my, the one kind of overall point that I shared with Mary and I'll share with you is, um, you know, given how small, you know, how small these boxes can become and how challenging these deals can be to put together, um, the one thing that I would caution uh, about maybe creating new requirements is that, you know, every time you create more requirements in these policies, um, you do increase the likelihood of plussing up the cost. And if anything, from a housing affordability standpoint in these programs, um, we'd like to do more to try to decrease the cost or at least lessen that pressure. Um, and there are a lot of other things that are being discussed as far as like the different fees or other things that can kind of be relaxed to make these projects more viable. Parking, parking something that we talk about a lot too. Um, so I would be very wary of any um, uh, kind of requirements uh, about speed, maybe that's higher. Um, it seems like the developers might kind of be starting to get there anyway. Um, and I also wonder if it's more dependent upon maybe the rates they can get with um, the ISPs. I know that typically um, these affordable housing developers are negotiating um, uh, agreements with one ISP and then they're usually, you know, usually included in there is a, um, you know, a clause, you know, they'll agree to only, you know, use that provider basically. Um, and so I know that there's been some challenges with the county because the county would like residents to have, you know, the freedom of choice. But in these deals, typically that's how it's it's been working is to get the cut rate. You know, you make an exclusive, uh, you know, exclusive clause in, in the, the contract. So um, that's my my word of, of caution would be um, if there's going to be more requirements in these deals that um, there just should be like a very compelling reason um, for doing so, given the difficulty. Of, uh, of putting them together. And I, I guess that's it. And I'm happy to field questions and and have a conversation and I will exit out of here. Oh, thanks very much, Eric. Questions? And if you have your hand up, I don't see you at the moment because I have this on. Quick. There you go, John, go ahead. Oh, and, and uh, Kevin, then, okay. Uh, I see. Go, go ahead, Kevin. Kevin? And then John. Yeah, hi there. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, you know, just you talked about the county having a scheme to encourage affordability and and uh, providing financing and so forth. And given sure. that's the case, given that's the case, why is the affordable housing stock going down so much in the county? Uh, this is a really desirable place to live, um, and it's really expensive. Um, so, um, you know, the county. So, like, if if we just kind of like paused, <laughs> you know, all development, put paused everything right now um, for the county just to catch up to 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 reclaim kind of a lot of the market rate affordable units that have been lost. Um, we the, the county would probably have to invest at least double, if not maybe two and a half times what it does right now. Um, it housing is really expensive to to build. You know, there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that construction, labor, you know, what have you, um, it's it's really expensive. I, I My view is the county has been fairly aggressive um, in trying to take steps to to loosen things up and, and to try to get, you know, developers to, to build more. Um, but that's ultimately still the private market has to act, right? The county can encourage, but it can't force. Um, so I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but you know, it's it's we live in a very high high demand area, and um, my view is we just haven't built enough housing probably over the last twenty years to satisfy demand across the board, um, and so that's also like a challenge that we're we're facing. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I know in the affordability calculations. There's not just the price of the housing itself, but there's some also some other calculations that uh, that costs that may or may not be included in the official calculations. I've seen people trying to throw in kind of you know not just the cost of housing, but also the cost of housing and transportation. Um, and and one of the things that I think is really important that needs to be included is the cost of internet. Right, mm -hmm. and not just for the committed affordable units, but also for the market rate affordable units. Um, I think 
you know, I am a strong proponent of investing in, um, you know, in committed affordable units and having those units available, but we will never subsidize our way to a, a affordable cost of living for people making 80 to 120% of area median income. And we need to be able to have a robust housing stock uh, for that, for that area, for that level of, of housing income. Um, and so is internet access can my question is is internet access currently included in the cost calculation for affordability overall as as other utilities or transportation costs might be um, and if not i would recommend that it should be um, because it is as we've seen an essential um to to modern contemporary life yeah i i don't I don't know uh, precisely the answer to that. I mean, I know, you know, typically when we speak about affordable housing here in Arlington, um, uh, you know, the the general kind of rubric is we don't want folks to spend more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, and then, you know, we're, if you've heard, you've heard AMI maybe the thrown around area median income. And of course that's, you know, that's a localized metric and that depends upon, you know, household size as well. So it's, you can't there's really no what there's really no number you can you can throw around um so i don't that doesn't really answer your question I, I think it's a fair point i mean i think it's something you know given that the county did this kind of pilot initiative with appa at arlington mill i i think it's certainly something that's on their radar i'm i'm kind of curious to see what what happens with their as it called connect arlington or whatever initiative they have um, it seems like that's something that should be pursued more and maybe integrated uh, into maybe these developments or at least to encourage these developers. If the, for example, if the county were to actually create like a broadband authority or, or whatever, I, I don't know. So, so that's, what um, I'm, yeah. that's what I'm really driving at, Eric, is that it it is very difficult to drive down the cost of building new housing in this area because the land is so expensive um, and and labor costs are high. So if we can't drive down the cost of housing, can we drive down the cost of some of our other costs of living to make the overall affordability um, more manageable for, for, for a more diverse range of household incomes? One of those being transportation, right? If you sure. don't have to own a car, you can afford more on your mortgage payment because you can walk places and you don't have a car payment. And if you don't have to pay you know, 75 bucks a month for your broadband internet, you can pay 10 bucks a month for an internet. That's, you know, 65 bucks a month on a 30 year mortgage is a lot of buying power. So um, I, I would I would encourage you to in the Housing Commission to think about some more um, more aspects of affordability generally and try and make some recommendations for incorporating those into our housing policy. Yeah, it's it, I, I appreciate that. It's a great thought. I mean, I, again, not a not a housing professional, um, but uh, uh, I, I know, you know, the parking is one area where the county has looked at in the last few years of how it can kind of, um, and I, uh, and I'm interested in that too, you know, are there things that we're requiring developers to do that they don't necessarily have to do in these bigger buildings that could help ease the pressure on costs a little bit, maybe it doesn't make it that much more affordable. Um, but it at least, you know, Nate maybe enables them to build more units. More units means more in the market, means a little less pressure, right, uh, on the market, which is what we want to see. The other thing is, and, and just real quick, a plug for what the county is working on, the 80 to 120% range. You know, the missing middle study, which you may or may not be aware of, is going on by housing staff. Um, you know, it's it's gotten some controversy because, you um, you know, zoning is complicated and it's, you know, zoning affects the market and you never know exactly what the market's going to do. And obviously the market will dictate costs. Um, but it's pretty clear that if we can um, have more folks live on one lot, like a 5,000 square foot lot, um, overall, over time, that can certainly, at least um, if it's not going to uh, drive prices down, at least slow the growth. Um, which is something we still need too. If we can at least slow the the growth of of the costs, that can that can help, right? It's not going to solve everything. Um, and so the missing middle study is going on. Certainly encourage anybody who's interested to kind of engage with that. 
I think it's a great effort by staff. They haven't made any recommendations yet. They're doing a very holistic view of kind of everything as far as our zoning schemes. And and I, I believe either later this fall, they're going to come out with some preliminary recommendations. So I encourage you to check that out. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Mike? You got a question? Mike Carlson. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Very you're, you're low, Mike. Yeah. What I can do about that, I'll try to speak up. Eric, I'm wondering if you could, could address some questions about master planning. I understand there's a housing master plan that's part of the comprehensive plan. Well, there's an affordable housing master plan that was adopted in September 2015. It's actually funny you mention it. It's it's under review. The implementation is under review by staff. We just had a had a meeting last night. So, yep. And, and so my question are related to that. We've we've sort of recommended that such a master plan be created for digital services and broadband in the county. And um, some. Oh, I think we lost you. Ourselves in there. So my question is, how, how, how much how much does the master planning process inform and help you folks? And what's the division of labor between county staff commission members and the public at large in creating that master plan? Oh, geez. OK, um, so um, that plan was 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 all, was adopted in 2015. That was before I was on the commission. That was like a multi year effort. I want to say at least two to three years um, that had that had a working group from representatives around the community. The last time the county had holistically looked at that was like maybe 10 years prior. And so that was it was a very heavy lift by staff. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. It was a very heavy lift by staff. Um, they had a lot of community meetings. And then um, even like once there was a draft, I think it was like six to eight months until they finally adopted it because then they did a road show, took it to everybody, did a lot of public presentations, you know, that type of thing. Um, as far as how it's been working, um, I you know, we do tie a lot of, of what we, we hear from staff as far as recommendations. Um, uh, to the master plan, you know, and the, it, there's a master plan, that, then they have an implementation framework, which really is kind of like it spells out kind of what the master plan's goals are. The implementation framework says, okay, here's how we're going to implement this goal. Here's how we're going to do this. And so that's kind of what we're reviewing right now is like what's working, kind of what's not. So that definitely is tied. Um, and as far as division of labor, I mean, staff does the work. I mean, they, I mean, they, they, they make the deals. They, you know, they're doing all of this. I, I see our role as a commission um, really to a, a couple things. So um, I think the best thing we can do um, is provide a public forum um, for issues that have to be discussed about, you know, housing development. But but recently also um, housing conditions has been a big focus of ours. Um, if you've seen the news, there's been a lot of um, challenges, a nice way to say it. There's been a lot of failures at the Serrano which is an HC property on Columbia Pike. Um, and so our last two meetings have been like four hours long listening to residents and trying to help them and and then directing back to staff. And so I think that's the most valuable thing that we can do as an advisory group is to provide, provide a public forum. The county board does not have the bandwidth necessarily to do that all the time. Um, I also think that we can, you know, by putting together a record of things that we observe, either responding to staff's recommendations or coming up with our own ideas. Um, I think we can, by, by putting that in writing, by having reports, by going to the county board regularly, um, I think we can be impactful on um, at least keeping things on their radar. Um, oftentimes what we're coming up with isn't necessarily an original thought or original concept, but the county board has a lot going on. And my experience has been, you just gotta keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them because it's very easy for things to kind of fall off their radar. There's just there's so much going on and they're part time. Um, and so as an advisory group, I think those two things, public forum and just keeping things on their radar are, are the best things you can do. This is my two cents. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, Eric, you've generated another question. David, David Husband, you had a you had a question? Yeah, more more of a comment. Um, uh, as as people in the commission may know, I actually have view housing as uh, something I've been very concerned about over the years, and in part that's because I was living in Arlington up until recently and needed to move out 
to Fairfax to find housing that was affordable for me, but I'm by no means uh, a regular affordable housing person. I'm actually, you know, doing pretty well for myself. And so this is more of an observation and kind of ties to your last comment. The county is very, very slow and very, very reactive. And I think that the affordable housing, the missile, missing middle discussion has been on the horizon for the county since, since that 2015. I remember that roadshow. I also remember nothing happening for years and years and years related to that roadshow. And I don't know. And look, I'm a member of the commission. You're a member of the commission. We're all doing what we can. But it strikes me that this study it until our eyes bleed and then write a report that says the same sort of thing over again and we discover housing stock is depreciating in the meantime. I don't have the answers, but I'm very, very concerned that we're not actually we're not actually making real changes here other than tinkering at the margins. And I know, Eric, that you are obviously very committed and you're doing good work. And so that, I don't want you want you to take this as a, on a personal level, but I am struck by the fact that the county is not giving this the attention it deserves uh, and have has not been. I and I have said this to many county board members. I mean, I, I talked to Eric Gutschall when he was still around about this quite a bit. And so I don't know if you have a reaction to that or a strategy to how does this sort of dynamic. I mean, we want to talk about housing pressures. I can tell you what the housing pressure is. We, we, we brought in Amazon HQ2 and the housing prices doubled overnight. Uh, that, that is the housing pressure we brought on ourselves. And we chose to do that. We have all this, we have all this vacant commercial space that could be converted into housing if we were interested in it. But whenever I brought that up to, I brought that up to Libby, I brought that up to some other people that did not even like register. Like the idea of converting the commercial real estate that was vacant and not generating any tax revenue into housing. Oh man, that was, that was a terrible idea. So there's a lot in there for you to unpack, but I just wanted to see what, uh, what your reactions were to my, my mini rant there. We could have a whole conversation about the relationship between the county board and the staff. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I think that's fair. Um, I think a lot of that is fair. Um, I think the county is fairly reactive on things. Um, I do think that there are some political realities. I think that with the missing middle, there there will be changes. Um, my fear is like there's there's a roadshow of folks who are going around to single family um, the neighborhoods. I'm a civic association president and they're going around and they're basically it's 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 I'm sorry and I'm I'm I apologize if, if folks don't agree with me, but I think it's fear mongering. They're going around and telling folks that they are gonna come into your neighborhood and it's environmental impacts. And there's there's a lot um of of things in there that I don't necessarily think are are accurate representations of of what's happening and the data. Um and so I don't know that that will dissuade the county board from passing something. I am concerned that it will maybe convince them to not go all the way in what they should do. Um, that it may they may trim their sails a little bit. Um, and you know, not all county board members are created equal either. Um, so, yeah, I think that's fair. I think the county board should have been ahead of this. I think to be a little bit fair to staff. Um, Th there's not enough of them. Um, they're not, they don't have enough money. Um, th there's, there's a lot going on. I mean, since I've been on the commission, one of the criticisms of us has been, you guys are so reactive and I'm like, come to our meet, like literally all the stuff that we're just reacting to takes like three or four hours a month. I mean, just in one, you know, if we're having one meeting, there's a lot going on. Um, and so that says that staff has a lot going on. So, um, but you're, it's a fair point. I mean, it's 2021, we've known this for a while. Um, and you're right, that was Eric Gutshall's whole thing was the missing middle and, and pushing the missing middle. I mean, a, uh, Alliance for Housing Solutions had a forum four years ago on the missing middle. Um, so it's not a new concept by any means. So um, totally fair point. Um, you know, we so, I mean, I, I mean, not to one of the problems that I saw was that the county is wedded to a budgeting model of 50 50. 50% residential taxes, 50% commercial taxes. Most jurisdictions have something like 70, 80 uh, residential and 20, 30% commercial. If you continue a 50, 50 model and you have to have that much commercial real, I lived in South, I lived in Pentagon City, now the new national landing or whatever it is. The, the problem is if you had put houses there instead of, um, of, of real estate, you could have put them in a special tax zone. You could have given them much higher rates. People would have paid it. You could then use the money from that tax to build the infrastructure that could have then built affordable housing. You could have had dedicated revenue coming from people buying millionaire townhomes 
to pay for affordable housing instead of all that real estate. I went to a planning meeting because I too was part of the civic association there where they identified, they asked, what are you missing in Pentagon city? And we ended up concluding all we were missing was a hardware store, a whiskey shop, a local butcher and a couple other things. Everything else was there. They were like, do you need this? Do you need that? And I was like, no, that's around the corner. We have that. We have this, we have this. So there's the county's wedded to this model because of this, all this commercial real estate was in place and pre BRAC. That was really cool. They got all this money because all these people are renting. Well, the federal government is never coming back to Arlington in the way that it used to. And specifically post telework, we've got that whole space, again, in Pentagon City that was built for DHS and ATF, completely secure. They're leaving. They're going somewhere else. The county needs to reinvent the model of funding, because as you said, a lot of this is about money and how we allocate funding, and start realizing if they want to be a desirable place to live, they don't necessarily need to be a desirable place for businesses to be. Because there's actually the balance between jobs and what you're going to get is you're going to get a lot of workers who are going to live outside of Arlington and commute in at some point uh, instead of live in Arlington and commute elsewhere. And so this is all like housing is so big. There's so much food for thought for you on this. And I'm not pretending like I have the answers. But I will say that a big part of the problem is the county is wedded to this 50-50 model. And I think the commission should really think about that. Yeah, I mean, um, and that might be the case. Um, You're right. There's a lot of food for thought here. I mean, one of the things, just one of the kind of my closing thoughts here would be, you know, with the missing middle stuff, um, some folks are parading around statistics saying, well, you know, uh, basically more people who move into Arlington, like the residents will actually be like a negative budget, um, have a negative budget effect on the county. Like they'll basically they'll soak up more in services and they'll pay in taxes. Um, But you know what they're, but that also says not if you're in your late twenties and you move into Pentagon all City. The, all the workers will come and you know contribute, and then even if they don't live here. So I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing that people work in Arlington and don't live here, but I I do think that um, I I do think the county needs to be a little bit more creative, um, and I do think that we we do have some leaders who are trying to push the envelope, and I I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, th- yeah. I think I think I think there are, are certainly a lot of relics that are still around as far as how we view decision making and especially kind of single family neighborhoods. Not like I live in a single family neighborhood and it's awesome. I love it, but um, that that's that also drives a lot of the conversation too. Is like those neighborhoods being prioritized, you know, over the rest of the county, and that's just not the Arlington that exists in 2021. You know, we've over half our folks live in uh, our renters. And um, we have a lot of folks who can't even break into those neighborhoods anymore. And if they want to live here, you know, it's, it's not going to necessarily be in a single family neighborhood. And that's OK. Um, but that means that we have to really rethink engagement, rethink kind of representation and in, in the decision making processes. So not really a great response, but I, I, I'm with I'll just, you. Yeah. OK, just we need to. The, yeah, right, we, and I'll just tell you on the single family neighborhood thing, because I there there's not even the intermediate jump. You can't just go from an apartment to a condo to a townhome. There's not even enough townhomes. Like there's not even enough, there's the missing middle. You're not even at the missing middle from an income perspective and a missing middle from housing stock. It's everything is a million dollars and up or it's not available. Anyway, uh, Mary, I know wants us to keep yeah. moving. Well, yeah, well, we've, we've, as you know, we've got a lot on the, and Eric, yeah. thank you. Obviously a lot of interest yep. on our commission and we hope that, we can continue the dialogue because this, I think, as John was saying, it's something that we would like to hear um, as a follow up, what, how we're uh, calculating the affordable and whether whether the, the digital aspect is being included or being considered to be included. That would be helpful. So if you could direct us on how we, how we find yeah, out I, that I answer to that question be great. Are, right, I think the next steps there are just, I mean, my, I mean, I'll, I'll bring it up at our next meeting um, and just honestly just talking to some providers. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the first place. What are you guys doing? What have you heard? Um, they know as much about kind of the, the state scoring system and the politics of that as the county does. Um, so that, that would be kind of my first step just to see kind of, you know, where they're at. But even if you don't get a gig, I mean, even if you really got most of the providers to provide, you know, 30, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I think that would be that would be great, and then you build upon that. So it's a but start. 
Well, and thank you so much, Eric, because sure. um, we really appreciate you carving out time. And obviously, there was a lot of interest, and in, and you were helpful in multiple multiple ways. So, thank thanks again. You take care, and obviously, sure. you're more than willing welcome to stay. But um, you probably have another. I think, another, I, think my, my, I think my curfew has expired. <laughs> uh, the are, uh, <laughs> so, thanks, Mary. Take All care. Right, thanks so much. You take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Uh, all right, next on the agenda, um, John, you, thank you very much for um, integrating all the all the feedback. Um, Mike's input and other people's as well. So I hope that all of you have had an opportunity to look at the draft for the digital planning letter. Um, any I open it up for I'll give it hand it over to you, John, and then um, see if people have um, have comments or uh, edits. Yep, uh, so I'll bring it up to share and zoom in here a little bit. Um, try to incorporate all of the all of the edits um, that I received. Uh, Phil provided a lot of them. He was unable to make it tonight. Um, and I think I was trying to just capture the sense of our conversation, um, not put my own kind of view on it. Um, so if there are additional thoughts, considerations, I think we should um, proceed through Robert's rules. And uh, if anybody has a edits or suggested amendments, you can propose it and I'll I'll do the editing right here on the screen. We can vote it up, vote it down um, and finalize the, the letter. Great, thanks. Any, I'll open it up to the uh, the commission members. Any, any uh, suggestions for changes? As you know, I did have one, <laughs> John. Um, uh, I uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> the chair is suggesting one. Um, the um, I wanted to make the need to address the lack of far-reaching, current, and consistent IT policies. I just it's it's not a change of content, but just a change of uh, flow. Um, and I I think I'd. I think I'd sent sent uh, a a suggestion. So let me see if I can bring that up. And let's see. Yeah, I was saying um, that we could split up the sentences and start with we believe this is an urgent priority because currently there is a lack of far-reaching, consistent IT policies across the county, and troubling strategic gaps highlighted by COVID-19 response and pursuing the federated IT model results in a high cost business as usual approach. Furthermore, Virginia code, blah, 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 mandates the county have an overarching digital plan. Um, and the reason I wanted to switch that as I read it again uh, was I wanted to emphasize the urgent um, priority and wanted to make the points a little easier to read. So nothing um, nothing substantial, and obviously I can live with um, with what we've got. If um, if that doesn't, if the commission members don't support it, but I just thought I'd suggest a, a flow. Yeah. Do you have a um, that? Do you email that to me, Mary? Or I did. I did, John. Let me see. Let me try and pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments while John is pulling that up? Any other? I know Phil sent me a note uh, to Frank and to me um, saying he supported um, the letter. Martha did as well. I think she's on. She's going in and out. Any other comments? Um, any other comments about the letter? OK, um, so in that. Um, in that suggestion that I have, is there a um, Frank? You probably need to chair that since I made the suggestion. You need to take over and mm -hmm. and coordinate if you would. Um, so I'm making the motion to to change um, that part. If there's, and I'll turn it over to you to see if second? there's any second. Do we have a second? I will second. I think I'm allowed to do that. Okay. <laughs> and, and Mary, did you want me to insert that after the the first sentence? Um, reaffirm or just change the flow of the last sentences. Yeah, change the flow in the where it says the need in the first paragraph. Just change those that copy that. All right. 
Okay. That will be great. So that people can probably so yeah. people can see it probably before they right that might be good before we actually vote on it yeah because it's I know it's difficult when you you're not able to see it but were there any other any other comments on I think we've had plenty of opportunity to express um, our feedback on the on the draft but are there any other comments at this point. I have I have no comments that would change the content of so I'd say let's close out our action on the letter and then if we want to have a general conversation. Okay. All right. I think John's trying to get us the changes to the first paragraph that Mary proposed and then we can I think with that I think we would then entertain a motion to adopt the letter itself for, as as amended. We'll give John that opportunity. And while we're while we're in pause, Sharon uh, Valencia is on the on has joined us. So Sharon, welcome. Um, Sharon Sharon is uh, my counterpart on the Emergency Preparedness Advisory Commission. So we actually have three three commissions <laughs> tonight of walk through. Sharon, we really appreciate because our next agenda item. It's really I really appreciate you uh, joining us. So thanks so much for for carving out the time. Yes, and thanks for having me. That's wonderful. And I have you all on. I don't know if you all know this in, in Teams, but you can actually have a theater so I can see all of you in, in, in chairs. That's quite quite good. Right. Yeah, it's very cool. Ah, okay, all right. so um, edited. We believe this is an urgent priority because currently there's a lack of far-reaching consistent IT policies, struggling strategic gaps highlighted by the COVID-19 response. And pursuing the federated IT model results in a high cost uh, business as usual approach. Furthermore, the probably, mandates of should we put business as usual in quotations? Or or a dash in between yeah. business as usual, yeah. Mr. Husband, the grammarian of the group. <laughs> wow. Where are we? A uh, high cost business as usual? Yes. Uh, for, uh, He's going he's gonna to want a comma in addition to results that. in a high cost. I would put quotation marks. You're using it as a phrase. Excellent. That was my thing. <laughs> yep, both of you. The both the both lawyers. The, we the might lawyers. Be lawyers. <laughs> okay. If both lawyers agree, you know it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually you need five out of nine. <laughs> uh, do we, on the on the furthermore sentence, do we want to come up with a the mandates of? Uh, I think we use mandates twice there. I think we may want to suggest. Mm. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good catch, Frank. Uh, the mandates of Virginia why don't Code. You just, I think why don't require you just say the Virginia account. Code. The mandates would require. I think. I want to provide them the specific site, David. Yeah, I just say the Virginia Code, blah, 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 requires the county. Don't, right. Don't say mandates of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. We now have. Should we entertain three. the motion? Yes. Right. Do we have a motion? I think. Do we, do we want to go straight to adopting the letter itself? Do we have a motion to? I move. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any nays? Aye. I think we're good. Adopt it. Okay. Mary, you're you've got the gavel back. Okay, thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay, and then um, Mike, you wanted to talk a little bit about um, implementation or execution. You had a comment. Uh, yes, I did. I, I mean, I I don't want to ruin the the part. I'm delighted to get that out. I have a sense of urgency around this, and have had that same sense of urgency about fifth. And just heard a fellow. Say, 
say how important it was to be constantly before the board. And he also made an offhand comment on how difficult it is for the board to supervise the staff. And so what I'd like to do is in a conversation, perhaps briefly, is what is it we're up against here? I've made a living in this profession, and it's stunning to me to have people say that the complexity or the con do not merit a plan. And so what what is it that leads our county staff to be so opposed to a 12th slight? Because what we're doing and what we've been doing for the past year is not having the staff that I would expect it to have. And the proposition that this is complex enough on the narrative plan seems almost un but it's not ex in the county. What are we, what am I missing? What are we missing? Well, Go ahead, Jackie. Uh, John, you want to comment, and then Jackie. If I if I was if I was going to empathize with with staff, which I will do. Um, I also heard um, the commission uh, or the head of the housing commission indicate that a substantial amount of the work is on it would be on staff's plate to produce the plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine hesitancy about signing up for that. Um, as uh, a bureaucrat myself, right? I, I, I get it. Um, but I think that's that's why we exist. So I, I don't think we should necessarily uh, say that they're they're against us or against the recommendation. I think we should just make the recommendation that we think is valid and, and argue in favor of it. Um, and I think actually our commission is well positioned with the expertise and experience to maybe address, I think, some of what Mr. Husband has laid out uh, as, I think, a criticism and a critique that is widely shared in, in the county about the speed of the process of the Arlington Way as being too slow. Um, and I think from as technologists, we probably all have experience with faster ways of doing business and that we might be able to propose um, and and collaborate on a way to develop um, develop this segment of the master plan in a different way than has been done historically to get out things that are not controversial faster rather than doing the whole big thing you know delivering in an iterative and incremental fashion as most technology companies today do um, so i I don't think we're missing anything, Mike. I think there's a, a, a legitimate hesitancy about the amount of work that producing this plan is going to take. I don't, but I, I'll say what I said last time. Just because it's a lot of hard work doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Jackie, and if I can narrow my, go ahead, Mike, real quick. Well, I was going to say I, I, I'm trying to reconcile the, that. I mean, I. I I accept to reconcile that with the fact that I tuned in and I listened to county staff reference a task force product as the reason not to do a 12th slide. And this was before we had even received it. So there's a process that, that I'm wanting to get past. So I don't like to come and pretend to be advising. In the town on matters that the town to see and reach conclusion. Yeah, for, for, yeah. budget hearings. <clears throat> yeah, Where Mike. For some reason, you're really breaking up. I don't know. I don't know if it's on my end or what. Uh, for some reason, it's no, we're getting. <laughs> okay, we're getting like every other word. But I think what you said is, um, you know, what the, again, what's the, the focus, and I, um. You know, I I concur with John in terms of I mean, I I think at this moment institutionalizing digital planning is critical for the county. Now we can do it. 
probably multiple ways, but at the moment, the way the county institutionalizes strategic planning is through the master plan. And that's that's why this commission thinks it's important to do. Maybe they'll figure out another way to do it so it doesn't take two to three years, because you remember the environmental groups that it took about three years for them to get their slice in this in the master plan. Um, but what we're saying is if we continue the way we are, there are risks. Jackie? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I do think there is a, a, a gap in what, how we've contemplated the mechanism that is needed for um, doing a plan. For one thing, <clears throat> um, in many of the things, even though they, they are technical, they're more common in a larger part of the population understands what it takes to do a plan. In this case, the the basic elements of what a plan would look like, I think are not well understood by the group as a whole. And as and the pressure on the staff is not only that it's very complex and a lot of work, but that we really don't have the right combination of people to be able to be working on the technical answers and the policy understanding of, of what that means um, for our public. Because there are a lot of the, the aspects of, of the technical, technical aspects of the plan that are not well understood by the public. And so even to think about and prioritize these things requires a level of understanding technically that, that, that we don't have. We, we have some extremely expert folks, and then we have quite a few who, who operate in that world but are not extremely expert. And um, that makes it much more complicated. We need to define a plan which allows the public in general to have opinions, but to make sure those opinions are fact-based. And so, the, and one of the things that interrupts that is a great deal of lack of trust. We're seeing it in the, the topic that we have next on the project. We see it in lots of things, is there's a great deal of distrust about what it would take to accomplish different aspects of the plan. What it would take in terms of cost, what it would take in terms of expertise, where it fits in terms of benefit um, compared to other more common things. So it's almost like what we need staff to be able to help with, as well as some of the experts on our commission and others, is the translation of needs and priorities into a plan that is public, can be public, so that we're not coming out with, starting out with a discussion that is opaque to a lot of the people who are hearing it. And, you know, if it's yeah. opaque, it's not going to be a priority. Yeah, and David, I know you're next. So I would like to respond to Jack. Jackie, based on concur in terms of it's important to include right people yeah. to have be able to engage but i would say this is an issue in multiple organizations and in the international organizations i work with there are it governance committees and people who sit on it are not technology people at all but they do engage in the policy discussion right and they are schooled on that and and so this is not a model that we have to invent it is there that's and right. I've well, seen it in, work multiple times, so this is not in much more complicated situations than what we've got in the county. That's um, true. So, Although so starting with starting with ten years in in New York City, and technology that they desperately needed to implement computer support for their payrolls. Um, <clears throat> and did not have. I mean, they were doing an hourly payroll where the, the the software to do it was captive of the company that was developing the the software. 
what I have observed over my long sort of, I guess, um, ambivalent relationship with 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 the technology is that government is particularly bad at doing the planning related to it. Um, partly because of how it makes decisions that the typical government plan does not suit itself to it. And yes, there are some plans that work, but they're not generally government plans. Um, and and so it really requires um, some strong leadership at the at the leadership, not at the technical level necessarily. People who have um, technical level, but that's not their main thing. They're really high level policy developers who are able to work with the technologists to be able to shepherd this along. And we don't have anyone in our small government who is given the I'm using permission in a, in, a, in a different way, but who has the time or the permission to have the time to make this a priority. They all have other things they're being rated on, and they're not being rated on this. Yeah, I have comment, but David, I'll go. I'll go to you next, and then I. I know I'm mindful that we have another big. So um, go ahead, so, David. Over to you. Sure. Without disagreeing with any of the prior comments, which I think are are Jackie's points are are true, and I think Mike's points are true, and I think your point about integrating into the process that we have, even if it's not the best process, is true. So I agree with all of that. So my own unique thing that I feel like I contribute is I do feel like the county in general. The county has this ethos, and I would—I don't want to say it's just staff or board members. I feel like it's Arlington County as a whole. Feels like we're a pretty cool place. We're a pretty good place to live. We're doing really hot. It's great. And innovation is really hard to do when you're doing pretty good. And it's, in fact, why there's a whole book called Good to Great. And I think everyone in the county should have to read the book Good to Great because a lot of times I try to make suggestions and they say, well, we're doing things okay. And I'm like, but they're not great. And then I'm like, they're like, well, we don't need to be great. We're good enough. A lot of times I say, this is not world class. And they say, but it's good. And I'm like, but it's not world class. Don't you want to be world class? So that's my first point. We are good sometimes, but we're not great. We really need to have a mindset. That's a change just generally. Two, we need to sort of, we have a lot of different perspectives. As a lawyer uh, in the cybersecurity world, in the federal government, I have found reporting, audits, assessments, planning, don't actually in and of themselves fix things. What they do is they force people to pay attention to stuff so that then they have to fix it. So I think that, again, I don't think Mike's plan is going to be a game changer. I think what it does is it gets you at the table, gets you on the agenda, gets you in that limited remit of time. I think that's all wonderful. I think, Mike, the plan will be whatever. But I think if you're at the table, then you're, you know, you're on the menu at least, which is, which is good in this case. I think one of my issues with working on data privacy and open data is when I get to certain levels, trying to explain that we should be focusing more on open data or data privacy or bringing these in. It's like limited resources, limited time, limited staff. We don't, we've been, the entire time I've been on this commission for six years, we're constantly struggling to find our calling, our vocation as a commission. <laughs> who, who are we? What are we doing? Who's hearing us? Who should be hearing us? And so I'm not saying anything new, but I, I do think, Mike, to what are you missing? It's like, we don't have a very clear idea of is our job just to advise staff? Is it to advise the county manager? We Is it to advise the board? Where is the board? How do we talk to them? So I think clarifying, and then of course the board is itself part-time and as Eric just said, not all board members are created equal, which I thought was a very polite way of uh, describing that. I think this is a fundamental problem is the county is in a generally, they're an above average student in the class, they're a B plus student, and we are the peop we are their tutors trying to get them to be A students, and they're just like, I'm, I'm happy. Would be plus, but they think they're getting A's, and I don't know how you change that mindset. But they, are, you know, that I think is the heart of the problem. Is this what mindset that we're we're doing well? We don't need to improve it that much more dramatically. Thanks. Thanks, David. And as you know, this is David's last uh, last meeting with us, so we yeah. If, we, could I have one one moment? You will. You okay, you can sure. at, yeah. You can at, at, certainly at the end, David. We would love for you to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um. 
so we will um, we Frank and I will be sending this to um, to the board and um, and then we will I'm sure we will revisit this at our next um, our next meeting, which we will have to figure out when that is, um, whether it's August or July. But we do have another uh, letter and Sharon, I just wanted to recognize you and also I know Jackie and, and John also were uh, sit on the Clarendon Innovation um, project. Um, it was um, and John sent you the testimony he did as a private citizen in in Arlington County. Uh, you all have seen the the joint letter from EPAC and Sharon, did you just want to give us an update on what happened at your commission um, when they reviewed the letter? That would be great if you'd be willing to do that. That's great. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me to do this tonight. So um, as you are likely aware by now, EPAC um, joined or, or communicated with Mary because um, there were we had several issues with with what was happening um, last week. Uh, um, our meeting is always generally a week before yours. Um, and at our meeting last week, EPAC decided unanimously to approve the letter um, either as is if uh, if Tech Commission decides to also approve it um, or if Tech Commission does not approve it, we will go ahead and submit it um, on our own. Um, and so we did the um, discussion was that we do think this is very important. Um, and, you know, even though the board has already made their decision, we as representatives of the community would like and, and board advisors would like to further go on record um, and and uh, submit the letter. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so the um, the joint letter, I will entertain motion um, from the floor. If um, unless there's any, are there any um, any suggestions, any any changes before we before we move to um, to a, either adopt or or reject? And John and or Jackie, do you want to make any comments before we move forward? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to find there's a couple of versions that flew around, so I'm just trying to find the latest version. Mary, give me one second. OK, great. Thanks, John. And then obviously you can share. Yeah, I think we need to send around the final. Um, uh, we did. It should have been Jackie. I think Angela attached the final when you received the agenda and the minutes. OK, I, I, I believe. Uh, I, I, it would be I, the same. It would be the same that you've seen. Just so you're aware. It's not for me. It's for the other members of the tech commission. Understood. I wasn't sure that they had seen the last. Yeah, it's, sorry. It's attached to the meeting invite. Um, to me, um, it, this has been a very. And I, I think John for John also, it's a very challenging role because we're representing our commissions. <clears throat> in, and in that, I'm trying very hard to be um, neutral and to provide guidance both for the board and also for our commissions. Um, <clears throat> and to have that pretty firmly rooted in the role that was defined for us, which was um, <clears throat> uh, to be dealing with privacy. And they want us to know about the other things and they want us to see the other things through the, the vision of privacy. But I think what they, uh, maybe not what they want, but maybe what they need is that they, they need not to get caught in an uncomfortable position with the public on this. So I have been concerned from the beginning that the way this is being approached is not was not giving the public sufficient information to understand this before <clears throat> um, being in the position of having it approved. And that 
it since it is a pilot it, and that's partly why it's partly because it was a pilot it's partly because it was not a grant we had to win the money for we were approached to be the pilot and so it, it has many different features about it and in some ways there's advice you might give to the particular group um, that's doing it about whether Arlington is the right place to pilot because there seems to be some misunderstandings I think about what you get from an Arlington pilot particularly in Clarendon um, than other places about the use cases of like gunshots which is one of the main things is this is you know in some circles this is referred to as the gun gunshot sensors and I don't think Clarendon is exactly the right place to be testing that but um, you know some cases but not not like here's a here's a place where you'll get a lot of cases on that um, <clears throat> so the issue has been how to try to work with staff and the more technical experts that are on this group to try to un understand how to translate the cost benefit analysis in a way that the answers are clear to the public. What, what, why are we, the biggest question seems to be coming, why are we doing this? Yes, there's a lot of things we're nervous about, but what justifies doing this? And what do we get from it? And the other question I think is that a large part of the public are saying, well, there are a lot of the risks that we and other people that we know understand in terms of the, uh, is someone else talking? No. Martha, can you mute? It's Mar I think uh, it's Martha. I just, uh, I'm not, I'm not listed, but I took the un, 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 unmuted. Do you see yeah. me? I don't see me. Yeah, Martha, you're you're the source of the. I just I just I just muted her. Okay, great. Fine. Okay, so <clears throat> you know a, a very difficult task of of how to try to bring up to date communication with the public when they're wanting to implement immediately, and a lot of this developing products that can go on the website and we can explain <clears throat> has come unfortunately late enough so now we already have from civic association presentations both John also mine and as well as some others um, a great deal of distrust about what it is that they really want to do and what the technology really is so if you tell the average citizen that there are no cameras, they're just um, optical sensors, they have a hard time trying to think, see that not as a conflict. It's like, and here's and here's the optical pictures you can put together, but we we're not taking pictures, and you know we're going to have algorithms that we can determine to to save the particular views that we want but it's not you know it's not video and so it leaves it as very hard for people to understand exactly what is being done but it's really as a pilot they're contributing the equipment so and what we're contributing is our data Right. OK, so we um, I mean, I think one of the things that we thanks, Jackie, I think one of the, the things that we want to make sure of is that this will not be the last pilot. You know, we've got to figure out how to do innovation and John, I will. Uh, you're next. Um, so that was one of the reasons that, you know, I was interested in us looking at this um, because I want to make sure that there are certain questions that are asked um, and it's not necessarily um, you know, who's involved and what companies are involved, particularly because Arlington has a very specific population. Um, yeah. And our concern obviously was the operational decision making, which um, John was in his testimony outlined. Um, John, you want a final and then we'll we'll move to um, 
to review yeah. them. First off, I'd, I'd associate myself with all of Jackie's comments. I think um, I agree with them all, so I won't repeat them. Um, I do think that it, it should be noted that in this board report, the uh, level of engagement was raised. The original board report had an engagement level of communicate, and this was raised to communicate and consult, and I think that was a, as a direct result of, of some of the feedback that this commission and, and I had provided. Um, I think it was a miss that it wasn't engage and consult up front. Um, so, you know, all all of the questions and all of the the mistrust are were totally predictable. Um, and we still have many unanswered questions. We're getting more of them. I think um, I I think that the and and Holly in her presentation to the board clarified that they would not in fact be um, using this data for operational decision making during the course of the pilot which i think is good because mm -hmm. i think that substantially reduces the risk right because if we're just putting them up there we're seeing how it goes and we're learning then all sorts of things could go wrong and there wouldn't be tremendous amount of impact um so i think all of the questions, all of the all of the concern, all of the things that we could or should have done better are all valid. But at the end of the day, the ultimate risk profile of this project and this pilot is pretty low. I mean, we're talking about people who are in a, a public space and have um, no reasonable expectation of privacy. And Mike, before you say say anything, I agree that we should probably raise our standards above that. Um, that should be that we should we should treat privacy as a civil right. Um, but ultimately, if somebody in a public place gets gets their picture taken uh, or sound recorded of them, that's that's not that big of a harm, I think. And that and that and that data is available to somebody who who shouldn't have it. I don't think that's a, a substantial harm. So I think the risk profile has been substantially lowered. Um, by the clarification that we got during the board report. Um, I do think, though, that it is important for us um, to voice our concerns as a commission because one of the other practices, and I, I laid this out um, during our last meeting, is we get the, here's the scope of the privacy data governance board that Jackie and I sit on, and it's about privacy. And then when any question ever comes up, we get held up as the cure-all to public engagement, which is well beyond our scope, right? Now, Jackie and I are both on on the, these other commissions, so we're not, we don't feel bounded by our scope. Um, but the, the oversight panel is focused on the privacy aspect, and I think in that respect, we are making some good progress in terms of privacy impact assessment um, and, and the privacy principles and kind of piloting the privacy program, which I think is all well and good. Um, but I, I think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned coming out of this pilot, and I think it is illustrative of the need for uh, a digital uh, a planning framework because all of these questions should have been answerable. So um, I'm not terribly concerned about the project, about the pilot moving forward and us continuing to participate, but I do think it's worthwhile for us as, as a commission to join with EPAC and, and voice some concerns. Um, some okay, of the final. some of the text in the in the letter currently, I think is out of date based on the presentation that happened at the board meeting with regard to the operational use of the data. But other than that, I don't really have any concerns. OK, thanks, John. And Sharon, uh, you have had final word and then we'll go to the um, the vote. Thank you, Mary. And I just want to clarify that there has been lots of back and forth on whether there will be video and whether there will be operational use of anything that is um, happening in Clarendon. So, for example, at one point they were saying there was many times actually they've said that there was going to be video to see whether or not that data is um, the data getting captured as being is accurate or not. Um, and they've gone back and forth on that. I have also heard them go back and forth, including just in the last few days over whether or not I, it will be operational use during that year. 
Um, so, so I think there's a lot that still hasn't been, um, that just isn't clear. The other thing that you should know is that we do have someone from Pentagon Force Protection on our, um, on our commission and she verified in an open meeting that it has um, not been that the our appropriate uh, federal DOD and other partners, um, at, at least DOD, um, have not been appropriately contacted. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys are aware of that. And John, thank you very much for for your support of the letter. OK, do we want to bring up the uh, John, do you have the, the letter to bring share it and bring it up and then we can just just so people are reminded and then um, mo anyone want to propose a, a motion to um, in regard to this letter? Uh, Mike, were you you proposing that we we adopt um, the letter? The, OK, uh, do I hear a second? I'll second. OK, thank you. All right, so we we'll, um, John, thank you for scrolling, letting people just refreshing people's memories. Because we we had a, we had a lot to read this week. OK, all right, so um, before us is some um, Angela uh, sent to us, right? Yes, yes, Martha, this is what Angela sent to you. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, yes. Um, so all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any aye, abstentions? Aye. All right, sounds like the ayes have it. So we will, um, so Sharon, we, we will send a joint the joint letter to um, to the board and you and I can coordinate that so we can we can send it. OK, that sounds great and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I think we now have an even greater bond, I guess, between the past and the past. Uh, not just because of that letter, but but I think it greater awareness as well. Um, and Jackie's been great. We look forward to continuing to do even more. We'd like to actually consider supporting some of what you're doing in cyber. Um, and um, so I look forward to the continuing our discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sharon. You take care. All right, um, Frank. <laughs> over to you, my friend, uh, for the legislative update. And I'm sorry, we might go a little bit over. I apologize. Um, we do like to finish 730, but as you know, we've got um, Frank, which is important legislative update, and then the review of the minutes and decide which month. So those are the three three things on, okay. and I appreciate. Mike, you had a question before we move on. Uh, yeah, just a quick suggestion. When Whenever we do get to the lessons learned about this Clarendon experiment, I think we want to frame it in the IT governance context because We've listened a lot to what's not possible, given the limitations on resources in the county. And mm -hmm. it raises a fair question. How then does this get to the top of the project? Uh, yep, it good suggests, question. It yep. suggests a governance process that is not very mature and is vulnerable to commercial favoritism through the political process. I, I would describe, Mike, the um, the reaction from the Civic Association that I listened into, uh, which is the um, Courthouse uh, Clarendon Civic Association, in terms of the why as baffled as to why we would why this is a priority. So they didn't see it as a priority. And, and I'm not trying to argue whether it is or not. I'm trying to get us to focus on the process. What is it about the way the county currently does IT? that allows this dog to get to the top of the heap. Yeah, how do you? Uh, That's a it, governance thing. Yeah, and Not it's also, this and Mike, I think you and I've had this conversation. There's a lot of innovation projects that are gonna come to, we are now gonna be Tech Disney. 
with Amazon HQ. So we want some process, some some agreed framework, so that there is a very, um, you know, a, a very considered way to, to move forward, right? And, and I'd like that to be a data rich thing, like who came to whom with what? And what <laughs> members of the Allington County move this forward for what purposes? You know, so I, I think we need to be quite thorough about how a project like this gets to this state without having been um, properly reviewed. Okay, Frank, truly, over to you for legislative um, update. I know you have a lot on the list. That's great. And David, I've not forgotten that you're going to give us, you'd, you'd love to, to say goodbye. So we'll, we'll make sure it's, that's on the list as well. So Frank, over to you. Okay, we ran out of time for the May report. So this is the combined May and June legislative report. So I will try to keep it quickly so we don't run out of time again here. Uh, anyway, on uh, May 20th, the FCC adopted a further uh, decision reducing interstate rates and charges for incarcerated people and uh, uh, and will limit international rates and will seek comment on further reforms, including uh, for incarcerated people with uh, disabilities. So uh, Mary reported on Connecticut's free calls for uh, for incarcerated people. So uh, it's it really putting focus on this. But the idea is that a lot of this falls on intrastate, which falls to the states, and the FCC has encouraged uh, actions like happen with Connecticut, but at least reasonable rates, anyhow. Um, the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, the EBB, uh, start date was May 12th, and uh, when el eligible households uh, became able, able to receive a $50 monthly discount on broadband, over 1 million households enrolled in the first week. I think we're over, I think I've read over 3 million at this point. So it continues. On an, uh, so that goes to the end users, of, in, in our case, largely residents. Um, uh, but we also have the Emergency Connectivity Fund Program, 7.1 uh, billion. Uh, well, uh, the FCC has adopted a report and order that enables schools and libraries to purchase um, tablets and laptops, as well as provide broadband uh, service for students and staff uh, through, uh, again, money that's gone. So the, um, so the FCC has adopted rules now on the Emergency Connectivity Fund program. Um, the FCC has proposed to accelerate the date by which small voice providers that originate an especially large amount of call traffic must implement the STIR Shaken Caller ID authentication framework. Uh, the FCC has also issued cease and desist, desist letters to two companies uh, to stop illegal robocall campaign. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr has called for a new approach to um, fund closing the digital divide. Currently, traditional telephone service has a universal sun, uh, service fund, USF, contribution factor of 30%. Car calls for big tech, large internet companies to pay their fair share. Um, there's also been uh, a uh, push to have tech companies also pay the um, regulatory fees that help support the FCC. Uh, currently, only largely licensees have paid those uh, paid those fees. Uh, the FCC has reached agreements with AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon to start delivering vertical location information in connection with 911 calls nationwide, which will help first responders quickly locate 911 callers in uh, multi-story buildings. There had been a lag in implementing that in uh, the um, some of the uh, some markets, and this actually uh, basically. Uh, was a result of a settlement between the FCC and the major uh, wireless carriers to implement this, and so it really is helping to ex expedite. Finally, our own Jonathan Adelstein testified yesterday before the Senate Subcommittee on Communications, Media, and Broadband and called for the inclusion of wireless in any broadband infrastructure package to maximize resilient, reliable, and redundant broadband networks. He emphasized noticing, the role the role that brought uh, wireless. A players. shout out. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and he and he did note that fixed 
uh, wireless broadband has become a, a very significant contributor to you know to providing service, but also competition. So, so it should have a place at the table in any funding for uh, for broadband generally. Anyhow, that concludes my report. That's a good summary, Frank. Thank you for including and uh, using my wireless device now to prove the value. <laughs> <laughs> great great to have you <laughs> okay um all right thank you very much frank and thanks for for being patient i know last uh, last time we were running at the end um well without further ado we have three not one not two not but three we have uh, march meeting minutes april meeting minutes and may meeting minutes um does anyone have um, we'll go with March first. Does anyone have any um, any changes um, to make? Um, any any additions, amendments um, for the March minutes? All right. Hearing none, I will entertain a, a motion to adopt. I move that we adopt. Thank you, Frank. A second? Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor of the March minutes? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? All right, Angela, March is done. All right, let's move on to April. Um, are there any, um, and you will hear a puppy in the background, so not to worry. <laughs> um, pu puppies decided that it's time, it's time to voice voice his her concern um any um any amendments any changes to the april minutes Barry, the april minutes report me as present when in fact i was absent <laughs> yes you were mike how did you do that <laughs> it was okay. intended to be a bit of a protest but apparently didn't have to splash <laughs> all right angela if you could note that in the minute for April. Mike was not present, so we'll erase him. Not erase him, but just take him off of April. Anything else? All right, I will entertain motion to adopt uh, the April minutes. I move that we adopt the April minutes. Thank you, Frank. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, All right. All right. And finally, the um, the May minutes. Any any changes? Any suggestions on the May minutes? I have another on my own section. Okay. A question that's attributed to me. Uh, perhaps it was garbled. It, it seems garbled in the minutes to me. But what I simply meant to be asking was whether the county staff uh, was for or against. Uh, master plan for ah, okay. Somehow that got lost. I, I, I hope the question was clear. I don't okay. think I got a very clear answer to it, but I thought the question was clear, given the experience of watching the budget meeting and having people express their opposition to it, I wanted to give them a chance to speak to the question. Okay. About it. All right, Angela, can we make that? Um just, just make sure that the question and Mike, if you could put, I don't know, do you have access to the chat? It's just what I, I believe what you were asking is what was the county staff's um, position on the digital plan? Correct. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. If we could add that to make sure that's reflected in the in the minutes, Angela, that'll be great. Any anything else? Anyone wants to make sure we. All right, I will entertain with that with that correction. I will entertain motion to adopt. I move that we adopt. Thank you, Frank. Um, second. Mike, do you want to see it before? Uh, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, it's that addition would allow you to strike out some other sections, but as long as that question gets exactly before the that's what I would. Uh, second. All right, thank you. All right, all those in favor? Aye. All right. Anyone opposed? Abstain? 
All right. We're all caught up with the minutes. Thank you for your patience. I know we're going a little bit, a little bit beyond and the, we've only got two more pieces. One, um, any preference about July or August? Does anyone want to um, make a suggestion about whether we meet in July or August? We usually have one month that is actually considered a summer month. John, do you have a suggestion? I, I'd, I'd like to skip July because I am going to be otherwise occupied with the arrival of my second child. Woo! Uh, oh, that's and funny. I. And I may, I may be conscious in, in <laughs> by, by the time the August meeting would be. But uh, if, if it doesn't work for other people, then I will probably miss, uh, I, I'll miss July. <laughs> Any, anyone, um, anyone have any difficulty with us skipping July and, and uh, meeting in August? It would be August 28th. Is that right, Frank, if I got that? Or is it August 25th? Is that right? Yeah, August twenty fifth, actually. August twenty fifth is the um, is the date. August twenty fifth. Are we um, any any opposition to that? Any hearing none. Uh, we will not meet in July. We will meet August twenty fifth. And um, David, it as as we said, we appreciate your six years. Um, you have been. Um, as 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 Frank and I said in the note, we thank you for the raising raising the awareness of privacy, and you have been a a passionate commission member um, on many occasions. So I I turn it over to you to um, to on closing comments, and then we'll adjourn. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. So um, this is a weird way to go virtually, uh, remotely. Uh, so I'm sorry that I can't see you all and talk to you all and, and, and meet some people, you know, for drinks. I'm not, I, I guess I should say this is farewell, but not goodbye. I've just moved to Fairfax County and due to arcane, you know, constraints that I guess that means that uh, this, this doesn't work out anymore. But actually, I think it's a good time. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the six years, uh, the two terms that I've had. I, I can't believe it's been six years. It feels like it just happened. So like that's both good and bad. Um, and 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 like uh, like we were saying, I, I feel like I've been able to add a lot of uh, my own perspectives on data privacy and, and data. And it's been great to have a venue. I've also just appreciated the opportunity to interact with so many different people with so many different ways of life and backgrounds. I mean, we've done a this one of I, I I say a lot of negative things about Arlington in the hope of improving, but one of the things that I do think is really positive is the way this group does uh, utilize citizen talent. I mean, the diversity of our citizenry and the diversity of people's experiences, having a former federal CIO, having former you know FCC members, and having young people, old people, like multi generational. Watch it, David. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah that. It's been it's been really wonderful, and it's been great to experience the local government, uh, in the real, real working side of local government. But thanks to Jack and and I don't know if he's here, but uh, David and David Hurley and all the other staff that I've had the pleasure of working with. I if I hadn't moved, I would not be leaving. So this is not a fault of the commission, but I do also think that it is all good things must come to an end, and I I think this is a good time. Again, I'm not going away, and when we get to our regular you know, work work rhythms again. I'll still be working in DC and be coming through Arlington. So hopefully, I'll be I'll be seeing some of you at, at various things. And I'm only only just right across the border in Fairfax County. So, but it's been a joy. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. And I wish you all the best as you continue dealing with data privacy based on the letter we all agreed to send. So that's great. <laughs> right. What a what a way. What a what an end. Right. Thank and you so much. Yes. Housing too. That was that was very appropriate. I like that. Well. <laughs> I, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, um, David. Yeah, thank and you. entertain a, a motion to um, everybody's waving and we will we'll get together for a proper with Denise as well. Right. So that would be great to when when we're back uh, face to face. Yeah, I'd come out for that. Yeah, great. Traditional, traditional we'll, cupcakes we'll, or cupcakes yeah. or beer and beer and wine. Or both. Um, well, if we go if we go to Buzz Bakery, we can we can hit ooh, both. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Good idea, John. Good idea. All right. Um, thank you all. I know it was a, a we had, we covered a lot. Appreciate your patience, and I will entertain a, a motion to adjourn. I'll move that we adjourn.
Thank and you. I second. All right. All right. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. I got I got a much more you guys okay, sound yeah. tired. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right. Abstain. Nay. We're good. All right. See you in, in August. Everybody have a good July.